All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks, everybody, for being here, and thanks, everybody, that's online. Uh, my name is Cinnamon Moffat. I'm the program manager here at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center, located in Newport, Oregon, and we are so excited that you're here and part of our seminar series. For uh, some of the new faces in the room, just a reminder, this is a hybrid event, uh, so that means we have folks online and folks in the room. For folks that are online, if you have any questions, just put them into the chat. We have a volunteer, Roseanne. Hi, Roseanne, um, here to read out questions. And so we'll be able to interact with you that way. And if you have any technical issues, also put them in so that she can help us resolve them for you. Uh, for folks in the room, uh, we ask that you have questions. You need a mic so that folks online can hear you as well. So we'll do questions primarily at the end. Um, and if you raise your hand, I'll bring the mic around um, or there's a mic up there on the um, stand. Other thing I wanted to remind folks of is as you come in the room, there's a sign up sheet. We are working really hard to figure out the best way to present seminars. Uh, we're noticing that folks are present are coming more often online. And so we're just trying to see how many cookies to buy and how much coffee to buy and what room to be in. So if you can help me by documenting that and getting the data I need to know how many people are in the room, uh, that comes by signing in. So I thank you for that. Uh, also wanted to let folks know that I am recording this and Roseanne, I forgot to record it again. I think, no, is it recording? Perfect. Um, I'm recording this event. And so that'll go on our past seminar page uh, in about two days. So if you want to share it with folks that can't be here, uh, you're welcome to go on to HMSC's website and go to um, visit Hatfield. And there's a place. Oh, it's actually the website just changed today. It's under uh, events. So if you go to events, you can find the seminar page. I also wanted to do a quick promo for next week. Uh, we have a guest speaker from the University of Maine. Uh, Damien Brady is going to talk about trends in aquaculture. He's going to be fully remote, um, but we are going to have an on-site viewing option. So if you want to come and see it on the big screen with all of your friends, uh, you're welcome to come get some coffee and cookies and we'll uh, hang out with Damien remote. So that's what's going on. Oh, and then big film fest uh, starting tomorrow. We're sold out. So if you've got your tickets, you're going to have a great time. If you don't, then we'll see you next year. All right, I'm going to hand it off. Uh, Sarah Hinkle is the one who invited our speaker here today. So I'm going to hand this off to Sarah. Thank you, Cinnamon. And um, thank you, Kaus, for coming. Uh, so Dr. Kaus Rakubacher is an oceanographer. Um, he's got a background in physical oceanography, ocean acoustics, and wave propagation physics. He's been doing this um, for over 15 years, doing both modeling and at sea measurements. Um, so today he's going to talk to us about efforts he and his team have been doing uh, to model potential changes to the spatial structure of upwelling associated with um, off-scale wind farms. Uh, if you love this talk and you have friends that you think should see it. Not only could they watch the recording, or Kaus is going to be speaking tomorrow morning on campus uh, in our PMEC coffee connection. It's in the Memorial Union, room 104. Um, but I just thought his talk was going to be so interesting. It was worth him coming out to Hatfield to give the talk and talking to people in Corvallis. If you're interested in renewable energy questions and you want to get on the list to get invited to future coffee connections that feature exciting research, um, you can email me and let me know to add you to the list. If you don't have my email, I'm sure you're getting the ones from Cinnamon because you're here, so you can reply to her and she will forward it to me. Um, I'm also pleased to have Kaus here because we're going to get together with the team um, that's been looking at uh, the uh, sound propagation and organism response to the Langseth seismic survey that was conducted to map the Cascadia subduction zone in summer 2021. So Kaus and his team have been leading the acoustic measurements and myself, along with my grad student Borland and Taylor and Scott, who's in here somewhere, uh, we've been looking at the response of Oregon nearshore strategy species. So um, stay tuned for a future seminar featuring cows uh, and uh, ocean noise. So thank you for coming today and um, look forward to hearing this one. Okay, uh, I think I'm recording. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, thank you all for uh, inviting me. Thanks, Sarah, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to this uh, in-person talk. Uh, it's been a while since I've given one of these. The last time I gave it uh, uh, last summer, the computer crashed in front of me, and I was make, describing figures while, while, while the IT was trying to get the computer back up and running. So uh, fingers crossed it won't happen now. Um, 
All right, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to talk about potential effects of offshore wind farms on the California upwelling ecosystem. Um, and I, I'm going to dive right into, I'm just going to introduce our team first. Um, it, like, you know, it's definitely a, a concerted team effort that we've, we've been working on this, uh, this topic. Uh, all right, so uh, we, we're a fairly large team. Uh, there's three of us from Integral who, who have primarily been uh, uh, working from the Integral side. Uh, it's myself, uh, Grace Chang, uh, Tim Nelson. Uh, we, we are working with Sandia National Labs who've been helping a lot with the atmospheric modeling, so modeling of the wind field. Um, uh, the, the Dr. Lawrence Ching, uh, Jesse Roberts, and Chris Chartrand. Um, and finally, last but not least, uh, we were working pretty closely uh, with uh, Mike Jacox and, and Jerome uh, Fisher. Uh, Mike's at uh, both NOAA Fisheries and UC Santa Cruz, Jerome's at uh, UC Santa Cruz. All right, so first of all, a, a little motivation. Uh, I, I, I think I, by, at this point, uh, we, we as a society, we've, uh, we're have we finally re recognizing that we need to move away from fossil fuels in a, in a pretty large way. Uh, and uh, uh, both nationally and globally, we, we, uh, we're starting to set ourselves some pretty ambitious uh, decarbonization goals. Um, California, for example, uh, one of the planning goals at the moment is to get to about five gigawatts by 2030, 25 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2045. Uh, Oregon, uh, I, I, the, the plan was to plan is to get to uh, three gigawatts by 2030. Um, the, the offshore waters off, off the West Coast are fairly deep. Uh, there, there's a pretty narrow continental shelf. So uh, if, if you want to do this with uh, offshore wind, uh, we, we're primarily looking at uh, floating offshore wind structures uh, in fairly deep waters uh, and, and about, about 30 kilometers offshore. Um, one, 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 one kind of nugget of a number I've heard uh, uh, thrown around uh, or published by the California Energy Commission was that uh, approximately 10 gigawatts of offshore wind can result in a potential reduction of about 4.7 million metric tons of greenhouse gases. So uh, there's, there's definitely a, a, a strong motivation to, to move in that direction. Uh, the offshore wind resource on the West Coast is pretty significant, uh, and we have some pretty strong, strong, strong sustained winds, uh, primarily in, in, in northern Oregon, southern Oregon, northern California, down to about uh, Point Conception uh, along the central California coast. So, uh, if we were to go towards offshore wind, uh, these are the, these are the primary regions we're looking at, uh, and of course, with, with any new technology, the, the question is. Uh, what, what's, what's the, what are the environmental effects of this technology? Um, so um, uh, off the West Coast, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very strong up, upwelling dominated regime. Uh, uh, for uh, a, a little background here, um, uh, upwelling is primarily a rotational effect. So uh, when, 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 uh, when the scale of, wind, uh, scale, scale of the spatial scale over which the wind blows, starts to approach the baroclinic Rossby radius of uh, deformation uh, is, is when you have, uh, when, when you see this offshore movement of uh, surface waters uh, and, and, these, uh, and, and that movement is then uh, replaced by uh, cool, deep, nutrient-rich waters. Uh, that, that's coastal upwelling. Uh, it primarily occurs in a narrow, about a 10 to 20 kilometers band along the coast. Uh, and in addition to coastal upwelling, there's also what, what's known as curl-driven upwelling. So that, that, that's further offshore. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it primarily occurs when you have a horizontal gradient in the wind speed. So uh, if, if you have smaller wind speeds along the coast and stronger wind speeds further offshore, that gradient in the wind speed uh, can drive upwelling or downwelling. Uh, it's a sign of that, the sign of the gradient that determines whether you have upwelling or downwelling. Um, and the, the, in, in, so uh, the, the, that's another form of nutrient delivery to to, to uh, surface waters. Uh, the, the, both of them occur on, on different scales. Uh, coastal upwelling is, 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 is intense. Uh, it's generally more efficient at delivering nutrients to the, to the surface waters. Uh, curl-driven upwelling occurs on a much larger scale uh, and vertical velocities associated with curl-driven upwelling are, are smaller. And, um, and, and they both have been suggested to support different, different phytoplankton species and uh, in, in hyotrophic levels. Uh, so in, in this talk, uh, we're, we're going to be looking at both coastal and coral driven upwelling uh, and, and looking at the effects of, if you were to place an, uh, an array of offshore wind farms, offshore wind turbines, uh, what, that, what, what the effect of 
wind stress reduction by, by this offshore wind farm ha would have on, on upwelling. Uh, we are not the first ones to be doing this. Uh, th th there have been a couple, couple really interesting studies that have come out in the North Sea in the last, in, in the last year, really. The figure on your left uh, shows, shows uh, uh, isotherms uh, uh, along two transects uh, in the North Sea, uh, and, and they primarily see both upwelling and downwelling, uh, de depending on, on the distance uh, from the wind farm. So it's, it's what, what's being called the dipole effect, where wind stress reductions or wind stress changes uh, causes this uh, change in upwelling and downwelling. Um, this other study that came out just, uh, I want to say, a, a few weeks ago, um, uh, 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 we went ahead and implemented a, uh, a, a lower trophic level um, um, model, uh, and they looked at the uh, phytoplankton distribution, model of phytoplankton distribution uh, around, around, uh, around an offshore wind farm in, in the North Sea. Uh, it's a little difficult to see these gray boxes in that figure, uh, but uh, essentially the, 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 they're pretty small gray boxes. Uh, and, and they're seeing changes to, and, and the changes are, are both positive and negative. Uh, the, the, the increases and decreases in surface phytoplankton, uh, uh, model surface phytoplankton levels uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in that area there. Uh, so uh, we, we're essentially doing the same thing, but on the West Coast, while recognizing that it's a different, different circulation regime, the different, different upwelling dynamics uh, on the West Coast here. So before I jump into the, the meat of the stock, uh, these key results here, uh, we, uh, we, we look at one transect along Central California where we place modeled uh, wind turbines um, in that narrow you know, zero to 10 kilometer offshore region uh, in a transect through the wind farm. Uh, we, we see little to no change. Uh, we see some reduction in upwelling between about 10 kilometers to 50 kilometers offshore. Um, and then further offshore, we see an increase in the scroll driven upwelling I was talking about. Uh, if you were to integrate these changes over, over the over a wide, wide zone, uh, near shore to offshore, uh, we in fact, we see a small increase in upwelling. Um, one caveat there is uh, we do not model the ecosystem response right now. We are primarily doing just the physical oceanographic circulation. We are looking at changes in volume transport and in inferring nutrient supply from the, this physical oceanographic model. Uh, we, we would like to do the ecosystem model as well, uh, and hopefully we can uh, pursue that in the coming months. All right, so yeah, our, our goal, our approach, our goals for this project um, was we, we want to implement a wind model. So we, we, we place wind turbines uh, in, 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 in uh, areas identified uh, for offshore wind farm development. We look at the change in, in, in uh, wind stress uh, around, around the wind, around these, uh, around the wind farm, we use these um, modified wind fields to drive an ocean circulation model. So, so, so we provide surface forcing for for this for an ocean circulation model. Uh, we we run this model over a 25 year period, and then we start, we, we compute these upwelling metrics, which are, which are published by NOAA on a regular basis uh, up and down the West Coast, and and, and we, we we kind of couch any effects in terms of these upwelling metrics. Uh, again, here, uh, the ecosystem response is not modeled right now. Uh, th that's basically a, a flow chart showing, showing the way we go about it. We, we, we run a baseline model, so there's no wind farms. Then we, we uh, imp uh, implement these wind, wind turbine uh, parameters into the uh, atmospheric model. Uh, we, force, we use that to force our ocean model. And then in both cases, the baseline case and in the presence of turbines, we, we look at changes in upwelling um, and, and, and temperature and, and nutrient supply. Uh, a little caveat there is uh, the, the nutrient, again, we don't model the nutrient supply explicitly. We infer it from a, from a fairly tight temperature nitrate relationship that occurs below the mixed layer. All right, the, 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 uh, this figure just shows kind of our model domain. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a West Coast regional ocean model, um, and, and we, have, we, we have a coarse, coarse resolution nest uh, with a larger domain, 10 kilometer resolution, and we nest a three kilometer, a higher resolution, three kilometer uh, nest inside this higher resolution model. Um, uh, I'm happy to talk more about, about specific model details, uh, perhaps in the Q&A or, or later, but I'm going to skip to showing, showing you some results. 
before we go ahead and do any uh, infer any changes, uh, we, we, we kind of validate the model. So shown here is just the, the model in the absence of turbines because we, we, there are no turbines built yet. We, we don't have any measurements to compare that against, but uh, we, we can at the very least establish that our baseline model in the absence of turbine perform, performs well. Um, show, shown on the left is uh, a mean sea surface temperature, the bi model data bias. Uh, we have a slightly warm bias, but uh, it, it, it's within the realm of, 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 uh, of a few of the studies that have been published using a similar model. Now shown on the right is uh, the seasonally, subtract, so, uh, seasonally subtracted uh, sea surface temperature averaged across the entire domain over time. Uh, and, and the goal of that is mainly to, to ensure that we capture the uh, interannual variability in the model. So uh, which, which the model seems to do, 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 do uh, quite reasonably. Uh, we, we model a variety of different, different buildouts of turbine. Um, uh, the, the most uh, most dense build out is is when we take into account the uh, the, the wind energy areas of interest off of Del Norte, um, Humboldt, Cape Mendocino, and then further down south, uh, um, uh, Morro Bay and Humboldt. Um, uh, uh, so sorry, uh, Morro Bay and Diablo Canyon. Uh, Diablo Canyon is no longer under consideration, but at the time, uh, but uh, we, we 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 did have that in our models at the time the study started. And we kind of just kept that in the models just to kind of make sure we can capture the you know, most extreme scenario of development. Uh, the, the, the turbines are, are fully packed into, this, uh, into, this, uh, into each area of interest. Uh, the spacing between, uh, between any two turbines is about 1.8 kilometers. Um, and then in the, in the, you know, uh, for, for the case that we study the most, which is the Humboldt, Morro Bay and Diablo Canyon, uh, uh, wind, wind areas of interest. Uh, there's a total of 877 turbines across these three areas uh, with a power production of about 8.7, 8.8 8 gigawatts. All right, uh, first result here, uh, uh, we look at changes in wind speeds because uh, our, 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 our study really is, uh, is, is to understand what, what the changes in ocean circulation are when you have changes in the wind speed. So, so we start. We first look at seasonal changes in wind speeds. Uh, this is over 25 year old model run. Um, shown in the upper panel are, are winter, spring, summer, and fall uh, wind speeds. Shown in the lower panel is the change in wind speeds, uh, the uh, turbines minus the baseline. So, so, the, so the cool colors indicate a reduction in wind speed, whereas the warm colors uh, indicate an increase in wind speed. Uh, th th this, this particular figure shows a build out across all the all the areas of, of, of interest. Uh, so uh, it's interesting to see that the, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, there is a, a wake, a sustained wake offshore of the wind farms, sorry, downwind of the wind farms. Uh, but we also see an, uh, a small increase in wind speeds, uh, specifically inside each wind, wind area of interest. Uh, this increase primarily has to do with, with, this, with the model speed up of wind speeds Around the turbine tips, so it's kind of similar to uh, increases in wind speeds around around, around uh, uh, a um, say uh, aircraft aircraft uh, blade. Uh, but 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 the most prominent changes are, are 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 restricted in the vicinity of the wind farms, a little downstream of that. Um, the, the spatial scale of changes, uh, the, the the largest spatial scale we found was uh, downwind of the Morro Bay Diablo Canyon wind farm. Uh, and that extent was about 150 kilometers down, downwind of the, of the uh, uh, wind farm. Uh, shown here is, is a zoom of what I was talking about. Uh, the, 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 we see the increase inside, inside the uh, areas of interest, uh, and, and you see a decrease downwind of the, of the area of interest. Uh, the, the, the extreme right panel was, was something I, I just, uh, it's kind of a new result. Uh, I, I haven't shown this in previous talks. But I thought I'll show it to you guys since you know we're we're up in Oregon and uh, it's it's the, it's, the, it's the model area closest to uh, where you guys live. All right, so uh, uh, so we have these changes in wind speeds. The the first step was to look at vertical velocities. Now uh, we, we we tease apart uh, vertical velocities associated with this coastal upwelling in this narrow ten kilometer zone. Uh, and we separate that from curl-driven curl vertical velocities uh, in a larger offshore area. 
So the, the, the two columns show uh, vertical velocities and, and the change in vertical velocities for each kind of uh, uh, upwelling uh, phenomena. Uh, so I'll, I'll jump right to the, uh, I'll, so I guess a few, few things of interest is uh, the, there are these hot spots of upwelling, uh, Cape Mendocino, Point Arena, Point Conception kind of uh, stand out. Um, where you have increased vertical velocities, both from uh, both in the uh, both uh, uh, coastal upwelling and coral driven upwelling, um, in, in terms of changes to upwelling, uh, we, we see very little change in in coastal upwelling. Uh, it, it's kind of in in, in, the, in in the model in terms of the model domain, it's, it's restricted to a few grid cells um, in in the uh, along the coastal zone, primarily down near Point Conception. Uh, the, the the changes we do see or in the coral driven upwelling, where we not only see a, a decrease in vertical velocities on the inshore side of the, of the wind farm, but there's also an increase in vertical velocities on the other side of the wind farm. Um, as I mentioned before, um, uh, uh, the, 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 whether, whether you have upwelling or downwelling in terms of wind stress curl, curl driven upwelling, depends on the sign of the, of the horizontal gradient and change in wind speeds. So uh, you, you, the, 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 so you have the, the sign is, has one, one, you go one sign on one side of the wind farm and, and the sign flips on the other side of the wind farm, which is why you have this dipole effect. Um, and, and this dipole seems to be the, the catchphrase that, that's caught on with uh, changes in upwelling associated with wind farms. So the, 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 then the question is, uh, if we see these changes in vertical, or this dipole effect uh, in changes in, in vertical velocity associated with, with the wind stress curl driven upwelling, what does that mean in terms of Upwelling, uh, up, upwelling metrics, the operational upwelling metrics. Uh. So uh, we, we use two kinds of up, upwelling metrics. Uh, the first one is a uh, is called QD, uh, Coastal Upwelling Transport Index. It's uh, primarily a um, it, it it helps you characterize volume transport, so just how much how much water is being upwelled uh, to, to the surface waters. Um, the second one is the biologically effective upwelling transport index, so, or beauty. Uh, and that's the, the, that, that gives you an estimate of nitrate flux to surface waters. Uh, the, again, the, the, that's not uh, directly computed from an ecosystem model, but it's instead it's inferred uh, by relating temperature to nitrate concentrations. Uh, and that relationship has been found to be fairly tight below the mixed layer. Uh, the, the, these, these metrics are published operationally by NOAA uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and, and, and they're computed in, in one degree latitudinal bins. Uh, and, 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 and the size of the longitudinal bin is typically 75 kilometers. But in our case, we use a much finer longitudinal bin because we wanted to see the along shore, sorry, the cross shore spatial structure and changes to these upwelling metrics. So the first one, the QD, the upwelling strength, um, shown on the left is the, ba is the baseline case. Um, and uh, we, we again see these hot spots around uh, Cape Mendocino, Point Arena, and down near Point Conception, uh, uh, the Big Sur coast, which is just, which is just north of the uh, of Point Conception. Uh, and um, and we, are, we see a smaller hot spot right, right near Point Conception itself. Uh, in terms of changes to upwelling, the, the right hand side panel, um, again, so we, 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 we see this dipole structure show up in the changes in the, the upwelling strength as well, where you have a, a decrease in upwelling on the, on the inshore side of the wind farm, uh, and you have an increase in upwelling on the offshore side of the wind farm. Um, the, the reason why in this particular figure of the differences, uh, where we see this really sharp gradient is because we're computing these a lot in one degree latitudinal bins, uh, which are not overlapped. Uh, and uh, so that, that edge is essentially marks the boundary of that latitudinal bin. Uh, and then the changes further up north uh, in, in the Humboldt uh, wind energy area of interest, uh, uh, we, we see some changes, but they're nowhere as pronounced as, as, as further down south. Um, and, and the reason for that is, is the size of that, of the modeled uh, wind area of interest up near Humboldt is considerably smaller than the model uh, area of interest down by Morro Bay and uh, Diablo Canyon. Uh, that does change a little bit. Uh, the, the moment we include uh, include the other areas of interest in Del Nor, Cape, Cape Mendocino, and Humboldt, um, where, where we see a really complex structure because uh, in, in changes to this uh, QD index, uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm looking at the uh, right-hand uh, panel here. Uh, uh, and, and that structure is really complex primarily because all of these 
uh, areas of interest are adjacent to each other. Uh, so, so there is some circulation and interaction between, uh, between uh, the, 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 the three uh, areas of interest. Uh, it, it's no longer as, 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 as distinct a dipole structure. Uh, it's definitely a more banded kind of alternating structure of upwelling and downwelling changes. Uh, th 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 that's something we're looking into right now uh, to, uh, to try and understand what that means. Uh, in terms of the, of the time evolution, we, uh, we, 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 we look at a, a transect through the, through the Morro Bay Diablo Canyon area. So it's a 35 north. Um, we look at both QD in the upper panel, beauty in the lower panel, and we, and we look at the changes. Uh, uh, the, the red line is when you have turbines in the model, the, the baseline case is blue. Um, and, and, and we see this interannual uh, variability associated with the uh, ENSO cycle um, and, 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 and changes in, in, in beauty or they, they generally mirror the changes in, in the upwelling volume transport index, uh, but, but there are instances uh, where, where, they, where, they, where they're not always uh, tightly coupled. Um, that, that basically suggests to us that, the, that, the, uh, that there's not only changes to the upwelling volume strength, but there's also changes to the temperature itself uh, below the mixed layer, uh, which, which in turn, in our case, uh, uh, influences the, the nutrient flux uh, estimate. Um, in, in terms of significance of, of these changes uh, uh, with respect to natural variability, like we do see a fair amount of natural vari variability. Uh, and the table on the right shows essentially uh, at these three latitudes, uh, we, uh, it's only about 1.9% of the time that, uh, that, that QD exceeds the standard deviation of natural variability uh, or at 36 degrees latitude, it's only about 3.2% of the time that the, the exceed, uh, we see an exceedance above natural variability. Uh, again, what that means in terms of the ecosystem response, uh, we just don't know at this point and we'd love to find out. So the next, the next thing we do is uh, we kind of, uh, um, we, we look at specific bands along the coast uh, going from near shore um, which is at which is at the zero kilometer zone. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, I'm going to ask you to focus on on, on the left hand column for now, um, uh, and we look at QD and beauty on the left hand column, and we look at uh, uh, changes in, in, uh, for for two different types of call areas. One one is when you have the Moro Bay and Diablo Canyon, and one is when you only have the Moro Bay uh, call area. So it, essentially, uh, as you march offshore. Uh, we, we see a somewhat a, a decrease in, in, in both QD and a much smaller decrease in beauty as you start going offshore. Uh, and, and the largest change uh, in, in the upwelling volume transport, uh, particularly, uh, is about, it's about like, you know, around between about 30 to 50 kilometers offshore. Uh, the, 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 and that's in terms of the, of the reduction. Uh, when, when you start, when, when you march further offshore, is, is, is when you now start to see an increase. Uh, in the in 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 these transport indices, uh, and and then again that primarily has to do with this uh, increase in curl driven upwelling, uh, which we seem to find. Uh, so th so then now on, we 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 move to the right hand panel where we start to integrate these changes over larger and larger areas. So 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 uh, we we want we want to understand uh, you know uh, how far enough uh, from the coast do we need to go. Uh, before the integrated before the integrated upwelling indices start to asymptote, and we can uh, we can uh, estimate whether the, whether we have a net increase or a decrease in upwelling. So uh, we we start at this uh, 10, 10 kilo, at, the, at the edge of the ten kilometer bin, um, and we start to march further offshore. Uh, and and in in the case of uh, of QD, uh, uh, there is a general decrease in in the total total upwelling volume transport. Um, with the largest decrease when you start to look at a change over a 50 kilometer swath, uh, as you start going, as you go out to a 100 kilometer swath over which you calculate upwelling, uh, the, the, the changes are much smaller. Uh, but now when we go to beauty, uh, we see that for, for, for this larger call area, sure, it, it does mirror, mirror QD somewhat, where, where you have this, where you have a general decrease until you get about 90 kilometers offshore. I'm looking at the red line there. Uh, on, on the lower right panel, and by the time you get, uh, you know, by the time you get to the edge of this hundred kilometer swath, we see, we see a slight increase, uh, slight net increase. Um, for a smaller area of interest, uh, it's it's kind of an increase in, in mostly an increase 
you know, with a small zone over which you have a decrease in, in the estimated nutrient flux. And when you go further offshore, it's, it's kind of a sustained increase in, in the nutrient delivery. Um, the, 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 that again, we are finding has to do with, uh, with the fact that um, we're seeing generally cooler, cooler subsurface temperatures uh, when, 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 we, when we drive the model with these modified wind fields, uh, which, which then, then translates to increased, uh, an increased nutrient flux. Uh, we, we're currently looking at exactly what causes that, that cooling of, of surface waters, uh, but uh, it, 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 it's, it's been really interesting so far. Um, we, we then look at these changes up, at, uh, up, near, up near the Humboldt call area. It's a transect through the Humboldt call area. Changes in general are, are much smaller, um, but, 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 but this pattern does tend to, to tend to kind of mirror itself, but on, on a smaller scale uh, where you know, for, 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 for the, for when, you when you consider just that Humboldt call area, uh, the, there is a, a, a small a decrease in the net upwelling. Uh, but when you have a larger call area with a, with a larger number of areas of interest, so when you have all, all four, um, so sorry, all three areas of interest considered, uh, then, then we see this net increase uh, in up, uh, uh, over, over 100 kilometers SWAT. So uh, to, to conclude, um, that, that, that's, that's kind of our main finding to date, that it hasn't been as straightforward as saying there'll be a decrease or an increase in upwelling, but there, but there is a spatial structure to the change in upwelling. Um, uh, of, of note is that we see very little change in, in about a 10 kilometer nearshore zone, which is typically the, uh, the, the area where you have strongest upwelling uh, and, and the highest vertical velocities. Uh, we, we see a modest change in that 10 to 50 kilometer offshore swath, and then th that's generally offset by, by an increase in curl driven upwelling further offshore uh, with the net, uh, with, with, with the net, in, with, 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 and over, the, over 100 kilometer swath, uh, we were generally seeing a, uh, an increase in upwelling. So, future work is, uh, you know, we definitely want to. Uh, implement an ecosystem model and 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 come up with uh, direct estimates of, of changes in, uh, in in phytoplankton uh, distribution. Uh, and then, of course, yeah, we, we do want to go up go up the the food chain a little bit and start looking at fisheries and socioeconomic effects as well. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, happy to answer any questions. I think I'm a, a few minutes over. But... <laughs> Right, we've left lots of time for questions because I think we're gonna have them, but I'm gonna start with any questions online. Yes, we have several, but- uh, uh, the Read first, one of us. One yeah, of the, the first one uh, came in toward the very beginning of your presentation when we were looking at the slide that had the wind turbine arrays on it. Yep. And uh, the, question, the question was, let me, let me slide down here again. Um, what are the data for wind strengths oh. off Southern Oregon that give such straight lines? Yes, <laughs> yeah, I, I pulled that map yesterday, uh, and, and I, I was wondering, I was wondering myself, like where you have this, why you have these straight straight lines, and and why and why you have that 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 zone in yellow uh, or, or light brown where, where you have like the, the lowest wind speed. Um, yeah, that, that, uh, it, it's something we that we have to go back to to the NREL model and figure out exactly what's going on there. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a good question. I, I I don't have an answer to that. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, questions in the room. Great, thanks, thanks, Kaus. Uh, quick question about um, when you have those those turbines arrayed. Did you look at all how the the concentration or the distance between those actual units changed some of these metrics? Like, could you set them further apart so that there was, you know, less of a block? Um, yeah, uh, that, 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 yeah a, a, a great question, Taylor. Um, yeah, it, it's something something that we want to study a little more in terms of doing these sensitivity studies. Uh, so, so far, we we mainly looked at. Uh, at, at, at varying which area the, the full the full density of turbines are going to be uh, placed in, um, and and we also looked at changes. Change, what would happen if you change the turbine type? So what would happen if you use a 10 megawatt turbine versus a 15 megawatt turbine, for example? Uh, but yeah, it, it's definitely something we're we're working on to uh, do the sensitivity study to uh, change the density 
or change the placement, for example, if you have it only offshore of a certain isobath or inshore of a certain isobath, uh, the, 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 that's also something we want to look at. So that would, uh, you know, my, my, my guess is that it, it would change uh, the wake uh, down, downstream of the wind farm, uh, which in turn will, 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 will have an impact on, on, on our modeled uh, upwelling metrics. All right, question online. Do your models assume full occupancy of the entire call area or just the smaller lease or wind energy areas with turbines? Yes, yeah, we, uh, we, we do assume a, a full occupancy of the turbine area. Uh, and the reason we do that is we, we kind of wanted to uh, consider the upper bound of, of, of potential effects. All right, question in the room. Thanks, Gauss. I was curious when you were showing you had a slide that showed the percent of the time that the uh, decrease in upwelling exceeded natural variability at 35, 36, and 39 degrees. So the first question is that was so that's the percent of the time that it's more than one standard deviation off of the natural variability. So I guess I'm curious why we're seeing zeros at 39 and whether that means as you're moving north into more intense wind fields, are you unable to detect the impact of the wind wake relative to natural variability? Um, well, well the, the, the primary reason why we see a very little change above natural variability uh, for the Humboldt call area so at 39 north is, is, is it just comes down to the size of the, uh, of the, of the uh, wind energy area of interest there. It's, a, it's, it's about one third the size of the, of the uh, Morro Bay or Diablo Canyon areas of interest, uh, which, which kind of leads into Taylor's question or, or which is related to Taylor's question in the sense that if you were, if you were to change the size of the, of the area over which uh, the, the turbines are placed, uh, then what, 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 what those effects would be. So yeah, the, the primary reason we, we, we found was it just had to do with the size of that area. All right, question online. Does the atmospheric model properly represent turbulent flow? If not, what difference would that make to your estimates of wake magnitude? Uh, so, so yeah, the, 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 the model has been, you know, the, 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 there, there are some, some parameterizations in the, in the atmospheric model. Uh, uh, and uh, a, a, a turbulent flow is kind of uh, is average in a sense over a three kilometer grid size, a grid a, a size of the grid cell. So um, if we were to go to a, a, a much higher resolution model uh, on the order of say a few meters uh, around the around each wind turbine, or switch to a, like a computational fluid dynamics type model, uh, I, I, I would expect to see a change in the turbulent structure. Um, uh, and in terms of like what that would mean uh, to, 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 to larger scale circulation, uh, like I think it's, it, it, uh, we, we would see some averaging out of those turbulent, uh, uh, turbulent processes or, or the scales over which upwelling uh, uh, occurs. All right, there's lots of questions. We're gonna try to work through them. Well, thank you. That's really interesting. Is so the this is about the wind at the surface, but these wind turbines that are on structures and that are anchored to the bottom and things like that. Is this a is the wind at the surface of the ocean the big thing to be? Is that the how big is that relative to say structures that are under the ocean relative to ocean circulation? Is it is the wind the most important? How big is that relative to the other stuff that's underneath that's holding the wind turbines in place and things like that? Uh, 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 so I, I think you, I, I think I, I, my understanding of your question is I think you're talking about about uh, uh, about the effects of the structures themselves and wakes or uh, circ uh, circulation wakes around the structures and what that effect would be. Correct. Uh, we have we haven't studied that in 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 this particular study. Uh, we're, we're, uh, in terms of upwelling, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's primarily a wind-driven phenomena. Um, so I, 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 I would expect to see uh, very, very little effect of the physical structures themselves uh, without having done that study. Like it's a speculation on my part. 
but uh, in terms of upwelling, I, I would expect the wind to play the, play the dominant role. Over a long distance. An island, for instance, would not, I mean, an island as big as one of those wind farms would have a large effect relative to the wind farm or would have a small effect relative to the wind farm? Uh, the, 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 the island would, would, would cause, I, 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 the, the island would cause some, some changes in circulation around, around because of the physical, physical structure uh, all the way down, the, down to the ocean floor. Uh, so there's no flow underneath the island. Or, so I, I, I would ex expect an island to cause an effect. But in terms of uh, the, the, the physical structures of, of, the, of the wind farms over that large area, um, you know, there they, they, they might be an effect, but I, 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 you know, it, it's something that would, would be a really interesting study. Um, okay, question online. Are the boundary conditions in the baseline model and the turbine model the same? How about initialization? Yeah, the, the, the boundary conditions for, 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 for both the, for, uh, the baseline case and the turbine model are the same. Uh, uh, or the boundary conditions for the outer domain are the same. Um, uh, initial conditions, uh, that, 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 that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, uh, we, we, we spin our model, we, we, we do, a, 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 the, the initial conditions we used in our model uh, for the ocean model were obtained after an eight year spin up period. Um, and, and, and then we, we then run the ocean model after this eight year spin up period, uh, which we, we, we think you know, that the ocean, so ocean circulation is a chaotic system. So we, we, uh, like the solution would, would change uh, based on the choice of the initial conditions. But, the, uh, but there is some memory to that, of the solution to the initial conditions. And, 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 and an eight year spin up period uh, uh, puts us in a regime where the model is more sensitive to forcing condition, for the, the forcing fields and the initial conditions themselves, or, the, or a memory of the initial conditions. Okay, questions in the room. Hi, Kaus, thanks for that. So I wanna dig into a little bit of how you reduce the wind at the turbines. So clearly the turbines are smaller horizontal scale than the grid resolution. So you're parameterizing something in there. So you're taking out some percent of the wind energy. And is that based on a study, like a, a measurement study? Uh, and, and, so, and then I'll just finish. It looks to me like this is a less than a 10% effect. So it depends. Like what, Sarah, when we think about wave energy, what do we get? 8% of the energy out of the waves? So if we're lucky. <laughs> So wind turbines, I mean, they're actually pretty good, right, Kaus? So to walk us through that percent of energy taken out of the wind and how much do you reduce the wind and how do you do that? Sure. Um, so uh, in the, in the, to, to answer the first part of your question, uh, the, 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 there is a module in the, wind for, in, 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 the, in, in the WARF model called wind farm parameterization, uh, which, uh, which, which parameterizes uh, uh, energy, energy extraction by, by, by the turbines. So inputs to that to, to that module include hub height, uh, the, the, the rotor diameter, uh, and the type of uh, wind turbine in, in terms of the power uh, expected power production. So or the rating. So it could be a 10 megawatt turbine or a 12 megawatt or a 15 megawatt turbine. Uh, it then models the energy extraction. It, it models each each turbine as a uh, as a moment as a as a uh, uh, as, as, a, as a, a source of turbulence uh, and a sink for momentum. Uh, 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 those are parameterized in the model, uh, the, 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 uh, the, and th those parameterization or, or those coefficients are primarily have been obtained uh, based on land-based studies. Uh, as far as I know, like the, 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 the WFP module has not been re-parameterized or, or, or those, uh, ha have those coefficients tuned for offshore wind turbines. Uh, but, but there have been uh, a series of, of measurement campaigns uh, which have verified the uh, accuracy to, to, a, to a certain level of acceptability uh, based on land-based studies. All right, question online. You've described your results in terms of distance from shore, but the shelf drop-off topography varies. Do your models account for specific undersea topography? Yes, yeah, the, 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 the model does, the, 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 uh, the, uh, one of the inputs to the model is, is the bathymetry, 
So it does uh, it does account for for uh, um, the uh, offshore topography, um, and, and and the model does 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 with, 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 you know, the model does take into account the structure of the topography in 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 coming up with this, with, with a, uh, a solution to the circulation. Okay, questions in the room. Oh, good. Okay, questions online. With the upwelling, favorable winds expected to change in the next 80 years with more upwelling, favorable winds in the NCC and less favor favorable in the SCC, do you take this into account for the overall design to generate energy in the impact assessment? Yeah, that, 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 that's, a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, there's uh, you know a lot, lot of uh, studies so far showing changes in, in the wind regime, uh, changes to put a, a stratification uh, in in the face of climate change. Um, we haven't we haven't kind of gone through the, the the exercise of of simulating you know projected wind speeds and and the ocean response to that. Uh, it's it's something we, we we hope to do in the coming months. Uh, but yeah, it's a great question, and you know, there's, there's, there's many ways to think about it. Uh, one is, if you were to think only in terms of of, of changes in wind speeds, uh, then we, we well, so the, you know, they, 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 there could be some effect in terms of wakes based on changes in the wind speed regime. Uh, but the models also, and and in 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 reality, the turbines do have a certain cutoff. Uh, in terms of wind speeds over which they they they, they don't produce any more power, uh, the, the, that cutoff is generally around like ten to twelve meters per second. So uh, you know if if you have sustained changes in in wind speeds uh, for the current wind turbine technology at least, uh, then we, 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 it wouldn't really change the wake regime because they had that cutoff built into them. All right, I'm looking around the room for hands. All right, throwing it back to online. Okay, uh, I have Mike who raised his hand in the participants. So I'll ask you to unmute and ask your question now. Okay. He... Well, I've just got the unmute sign. Um, it's a real baseline question. I, as I understand it, the and I think I used to know this about 60 years ago, but uh, that sigma on 35, latitude 35, 1.92, is that a reduction in the amount of wind speed or energy? Or I can't remember if it's a linear tie to wind speed and energy or if there's a, some kind of multiplier on that. Well, it's it, it, it's a reduction in 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 each of these upwelling metrics. So it's a one point two percent reduction. Uh, in or, 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 sorry, it's it's kind of an exceedance. So uh, one point nine two percent of the of the time, uh, uh, there is a reduction below the uh, uh, reduction greater than uh, uh, one standard deviation in these upwelling metrics. So yeah, it's not. There's no multiplier. Uh, or uh, anything like that. Uh, okay. It's not related to wind speed. Well, it, it's not. It's, it's on a direct metric with, with the wind speed. It's, it's more about characterizing the change in the uh, in these upwelling uh, indices. Yes. All right. Thank you. Looking around. All right. Hang on a second, Matt. Great talk. Um, why one point eight kilometers? for the distance between the turbines? Is that like energy efficiency or logistics? Uh, it's, it, it's a bit of both, yeah. It, it, it's kind of like a, like a industry standard in terms of, it, it, it's related to like the, 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 the rotor diameter uh, and a typical spacing uh, between turbines is about nine, turbine, uh, nine rotor diameters, uh, which in our case was uh, 1.8 kilometers. Uh, it, it's, it's based on, uh, you know, uh, essentially, it, it's based on maximizing energy production. Uh, so if you're too close together, uh, if the turbines are too close together, then the, the, uh, the, 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 the one turbine is they, 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 they're, they're within the wake region of the other turbine, which can reduce the power production of both. So 1.9 diameters is kind of what, what, what like an empirical uh, spacing uh, to maximize energy production. All right, question online. 
Thanks for your presentation. You were clear that you've not modeled ecosystem impacts, but would like to. Do you believe it's important to understand the potential ecosystem impacts prior to building the turbine farms? Uh, well, that, 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 that's going in the realm of policy, which, 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 which is well above my pay grade. But uh, in, in, term, in terms of, uh, uh, of, of, of trying to understand the, uh, the science, yeah, you know, like, like, I, uh, like folks, do, folks do seem concerned about, about, about the ecosystem response. Uh, and and it, it only makes sense to go, go through that exercise before uh, drawing any conclusions about w w what this would mean to the ecosystem or life in the ocean. Or, you know, yeah. All right, any other questions online? Yes. Uh, what do you speculate the effect of the overall increase in upwelling would be on the occurrence of hypoxia events? Uh, I, 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 I'm not too familiar myself uh, with, with the link between upwelling and hypoxia events. Um, uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in a modeling study such as this, uh, it, it can be very difficult to look at acute events or acute phenomena such as the occurrence of upwelling at one particular point in time and the co-occurrence of or not of hypoxia and drawing any inferences. Uh, that, you know, we tend to average these results over a much longer period that includes averaging over any hypoxia events. So uh, you know, like, like a, uh, my, my, uh, my, my thought would be that it's something that, that's better measured than, than modeled. Keep going. Okay, I, I have Alex uh, who raised his hand in the participant area. So if you could unmute now and ask your question. Okay, he is not unmuting. Uh, I'll, un I'll unmute you if you'd like. <laughs> Hi, yes, I could not unmute myself. Um, thank you so much. I am curious about the modeling of the type of turbine that you used, if other types of turbines have different effects, um, and if this is a horizontal axis turbine versus vertical axis turbines, and what type of uh, effect those might have on taking out energy out of the system, and also that would, of course, affect the ecosystem as well. Uh, yeah, so in, in, in this study, we, we primarily model, we, we only model a, a horizontal axis turbine. Uh, and uh, and, and in, as, as far as the model is concerned, uh, as far as this specific atmospheric model uh, is concerned, uh, it, it only needs the, the power output or the, the power rating, hub height, and, and, and the rotor diameter. Uh, it, you know, it, it would be really interesting to, 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 to look at more of the nuances of turbine design and what, what, that, is, what, 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 what that would mean to uh, upwelling. Uh, but, but but I think like the way to go about that would be uh, to, to use like, a, like a, a, a computational fluid dynamic type model to come up with a really high resolution characterization of, of the wind uh, of the wind farm wakes uh, and then use that to drive an ocean circulation model. Uh, we haven't done that, but yeah, it's something that uh, it, would, it, it would be really interesting to implement. All right, that's all the questions online for now. Any questions in the room? Okay, what I'm hearing is that this is the first of potentially many uh, seminars that we're going to have as you put all these different models together. So I'm excited to continue to learn with you. So thank you for sharing with us. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. One more hand for Kaus, please. All right, everybody. Hope to see you next week. Same place, same time. Thanks for being here.
Okay, for everybody that's still online, we're going to end the presentation. Thanks so much for joining us.